Welcome to See You on the Other Side, where the world of the mysterious collides with the world of entertainment. A discussion of art, music, movies, spirituality, the weird, and self-discovery. And now, your hosts, musicians and entertainers who have their own weakness for the weird, Mike and Wendy from the band Sunspot. All right, and just want to give a shout out to all the awesome people we've met this weekend, starting with Aaron, Amber, Becky, Brandon, Brian, Brock, Cameron, Carl, Carrie, Chelsea, Cheryl, Christine, Cody, Daniel, Darcy, Dawn, Dylan, Alicia, Erica, Erlen, Eve, Faith, Gary, Grace, Heather, Jackie, Jamie, Jeff, Jeff, Jessica, Joanne, Jock, Josie. Jocelyn, Kay, Cabby, Carrie, Carla, Cassandra, Cassidy, Kayla, Kaylin, Keenan, Kelly, Kevin, Kimberly, Chris, Kyle, Lori, Margaret, Mel, Melissa, Melinda, Michelle, Mike, Miston, Mitch, Morgan, Paul, Quana, Randy, Rebecca, Rebecca, Robin, Roger, Rhonda, Ronnie, Shawnee, Shelby, Sloan, Steve, Sue, Tanya, Tara, Taylor, Vicky and Wendy. Oh, of course, it ends on oh, Wendy saying Wendy. Uh, we didn't even plan that one. <laughs> that's great. And a special shout out, by the way, to Terry Goodsky, who is yes. one of the morning show hosts there on 89.9 FM in White Earth, Minnesota. So check that out when you're up there. KKWE is the radio station. But he came oh, and interviewed yeah. us, and we had a good it's talk. Like, it's the K letters because it's on the other side of the Mississippi. Yeah. yeah. It was wonderful meeting everybody. Thanks for stopping by. To see you on the other side. We have returned. We made it. We drove a thousand miles. Yeah, well, we did drive a thousand miles up into the wilds of practically North Dakota. Monoman. Almost all the way to Canada. We drove through seasons. Yes. And we made the trip with our friend Scott Marcus. Tis from I. What's your ghost story? <laughs> the Two third weeks in a row. voice that you're hearing. Yes. First time I think I've done a back to back. Welcome back again. Yeah. Hi, Scott. Thanks, Thanks for having me here and on the road. Thanks for joining us. This was a spectacular weekend as we went to the Shooting Star Paracon in Monoman, Minnesota at the Shooting Star Casino. And we had our own booth this time. So we had to see you on the other side. Spectacular, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. And we met so many people. That's right. And so um, if you are listening to it for the first time because you met us at the convention, well then, uh, thank you for joining us. It is nice to, it, it's, it's nice that you came back. Yeah, so great meeting new paranormal friends from the community, and it was a spectacular event that I would definitely recommend to other people. How about you, Mike? Yeah, no, I'd say that the uh, the quality of speakers was excellent. Let's just go, we can go over real quick, uh, the speakers that were there. Um, oh, yeah. Nick Groff from the Paranormal Lockdown, so Ned Ghost Adventures, Nick Groff was there, along with Elizabeth Saint from the Ghosts of Shepherd's Town. Yep. Dave Schrader was the MC again. He's he's like the MC at all of them now. Yeah, and he does a great job. He was hilarious as usual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he does Darkness Dave, or you might hear him on Midnight in the Desert. Uh, he took over there. And he you know, he's the MC, the the jokester. Uh, yes. Grant Wilson from the Ghost Hunters was there. Yeah, and Dave Tango and uh, and Steve Gonslovs, also from Ghost Hunters. And Steve Gonzalez discovered this weekend he's a pretty good drummer. He discovered it this weekend. Really? No, I, I discovered it this weekend. Oh, you discovered it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, <laughs> I thought maybe he had weekend. a palm reader that told him, hey, you should pick up drums. <sighs> I thought so, too. I thought maybe he just found himself behind the drum set at the casino, and he's like, hey, look at this. <laughs> it turns and out. It's like, I can't believe it. No, he was actually really good. He played with the uh, the band that was there all three nights we were there, uh, Slam Abama. They yeah, should have had exactly. Alabama Slammers on discount all weekend. <laughs> oh my gosh, that would have made so much sense. Yeah, it would have made sense. I mean, uh, having nothing to do with paranormal stuff, no, but no. still right. a perfect fit. Well, and the funny thing is we were watching the band all weekend, and uh, they sang some country songs or whatever, and when they had like Southern accents in between songs, like I just thought they were faking it. <laughs> but just they showman. weren't. They, they totally weren't. No, they're from Birmingham, Alabama. And so they I just came thought, from down south. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, this band's faking Southern accents to pretend they're country. I'm like, well, that's all right. Like I'm here. They're just Minnesota, <laughs> like from Minneapolis or something or Fargo because we're right. We were right by Fargo. Yeah. Uh, about an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. We actually passed the wood chipper. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, on the way there. I tried to perch. <laughs> so yes, Steve Gonzalez is an, is an excellent drummer. 
Um, Dave Tango's excellent drinker. Discovered <laughs> what we had a lot of fun talking to him on uh, Thursday night. I didn't know his father was a police officer, so I thought that was a cool story. And that, that was his, cool. That his his father like goes on ghost hunts with him. Yeah, that was pretty sweet. Uh, Chip Coffee was there. Very nice fella. Yeah, and his booth was like right across from us. Yeah. Lucky so we guy. Could see Lucky the people guy. coming in. <laughs> <laughs> so he saw the spectacular that was going on. It was it was basically a three ring circus over at our <laughs> booth constantly. We had the lights flashing. We couldn't have music playing, but if we could, we would. The music was in our hearts. We yeah. had a, a special uh, gigantic paranormal prize pack we were giving away and uh, raffling off. So that was fun. We had a haunted gingerbread house <laughs> that we gave away. Mm-hmm. I mean, so, but yeah. The people across from us had to witness us dancing and singing and uh, <laughs> right, well, <laughs> putting on the show. Because one of the bigger guests was Austin Emilio from The Walking Dead. He plays Dwight, uh, the guy that Negan took an iron to his face. So the guy with the messed up face was there. He doesn't have a messed up face in real life. That's just that's just mad. That's special effects. Greg Nicotero special effects in The Walking Dead. But I was thinking about it. Like when you said, Wendy, we were singing and dancing and and, and begging people for attention. I saw him. <laughs> Uh, you know, walk around the convention on Saturday. He was checking out the different booths and kind of he's got a hat on and jacket and like walking around. He wants to see things too. And uh, yeah. in in between probably autograph signing sessions, and he's kind of wandering around, looking around. And like, you can tell that he's interested in checking everything out, but he doesn't want to get mobbed or anything because his, his face is on every poster. Well, mm-hmm. he doesn't want to get cornered either. <laughs> right. <laughs> he's used and, to being around a whole bunch of zombies, just out for blood at every step. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so it just made me laugh to think like, you know, he's trying to avoid attention and then we're doing every single thing we can to get it. (laughs) Like, yeah, every person that walked by, like, even if they looked at me like they were scared or whatever, I'd be like, hello. Come on. (laughs) Yeah. Come on in. The water's nice. Join us. Right. I was basically uh, it talking to Georgie. (laughs) Everybody floats over at the see you on the other side table. (laughs) Right. Everybody floats down here, Georgie. Um, <laughs> John Zaffis, the haunted collector. Mm-hmm. Yes, was there. yes. So fun to see all these familiar faces that we've seen at other conferences and met and uh, heard talk. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lauren Coleman, cryptozoologist extraordinaire, mm-hmm. uh, was there. And um, it was fun to talk to him and stuff like that. And he's always an interesting character. You got a great picture with him. Um, yeah, I did. I was like, oh, sweet picture with Lauren Coleman. Because I've been reading his books for, I mean, probably since I was in high school. You know? And, um, no, he's a great guy. And and so those brand new people that we've never seen before at a con- convention are, um, well, Nick Redfern. And Nick Redfern we've had on the show a couple of times. He's written books on The Slender Man, on The Men in Black, on Black Eyed Children, uh, I mean, Nessie. Basically, if it's a crypto thing or something weird, Nick's written a book on it. And so it was cool to actually meet him in person for the first time after like talking to him and being Facebook friends with him. Very cool guy. Yeah. And then uh, Aaron Ryder from Destination Truth. Mm-hmm. And that was pretty cool uh, that she was there. And I, I, I hadn't seen her at any convention before. J.L. DePardo. Am I saying, I always say that name wrong. Jael. 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 Yeah, also from <laughs> Destination Truth. Penelope. From <laughs> Pinolo from Club Dread was there. And that was I, our neighbor. She was right next to us the whole time. And I had to send like a, I didn't want to just take a picture with her or whatever. And so I had to like, I, I wanted to sneak a picture to Ben, our guitar player, because our guitar player is like the biggest fan of Club Dread in the world. Uh, so I just, you know, just at Ben, I was like, oh my God, Penelope is here. He's like, what? Is she? I'm like, yeah, dude, she's like in a whole bunch of horror movies and stuff. He's like, oh my God, that's so awesome. So I could tell Ben's heart was breaking over text message <laughs> 500 miles away. Did, did you get any quality time with her? No, I didn't even say hi. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I mean, I did say hi when I walked by or whatever. Sure. But, you know, because you have to pay for a picture or whatever, I didn't want to seem like I was trying to score a free one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, right. there, there's the etiquette, the, the convention etiquette. Exactly. Play by the rules. and Right. And I mean, yeah. and she's the granddaughter of Alan, the great Alan Ladd from Shane, which is mm-hmm. so she is Hollywood royalty. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Tori from the Mythbusters was there. I didn't get a chance to say hi or anything like that. And I don't know if I watched too many with him on. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. He's kind of of that first generation. You know, I think they did a handful, maybe a whole season, maybe half a season where it was just the two main guys. Uh, and then they had their like the sidekicks that started out as interns for the show that they became the B storyline. The 
Oh, yeah, yeah, like the red-haired girl and stuff? Yes, exactly. And he was one of those three. So he's uh, the so red-haired he girl. On, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good makeup. Um, <laughs> but so he was on the show for a very long time, and we had so much fun at the booth meeting people that we didn't get to break away and go see a lot of presentations at this one. Yes, yes, just so everybody has the context here. Yeah. It was very intense. You know, Like I said, it was a three-ring circus, but at any given time, it was at least a two-ring circus. So, <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Between Mike... Myself and Scott, we were always at the booth, and so therefore we didn't get to see a lot of the presentations, but we were really focused on meeting people, and we wanted to meet some more. Uh, we wanted to meet any of our current audience members as well as some potential future audience members yeah. and just people who are into the same stuff we are. So we really kind of had to tag team, so only one of us could leave the booth at a time. And you guys each got to go in and see a presentation. Yes. So... Scott, why don't you tell us a little about the one that you saw? Oh, happily. And, and we're going to hear more from these two soon. But uh, just to go back uh, really briefly to Tori from Mythbusters, you do wonder what is a guy like that doing at a paranormal conference? And, and unfortunately, we can't answer that one since we didn't go in. <laughs> but it is you, you wonder if he was there from a skeptic point of view, uh, somebody that is trying to bust ghost stories and not ghost busting in that sense but um and, and he his presentation was with actually one of the ghost hunters i can't remember if it was tango or steve but um but yeah i don't know it's very interesting because you know they come from a science and, and uh, physics uh point of view so i don't know interesting uh, hopefully we will see him on the circuit some more it seemed like yeah. a lot of people that spoke uh, or even just appeared like jordan and, and aaron and jael they all have done this uh, conference multiple times so maybe in the future we will be able to see Tori. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, and we can see him and Dave Tango have a paranormal beatdown. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> it would be it would be cool if there was a uh, believer skeptic debate on stage. Absolutely, uh, like they had at the Milwaukee Paranormal Conference two years ago, oh, where yeah. you had like a, ro- a, a debate about Roswell with Mark O'Connell mm-hmm. and Don Schmidt. Mark O'Connell, who thinks it's hokum. At Hokum, let's <laughs> talk like it's 1950s. I believe it's Hokum. <laughs> to party uh, like it's 1899, brother. <laughs> I know. Uh, and Don Schmidt, who's a you know a true believer, and he's written several books on it. So well, I would, Mike, you instigated that one, so maybe you can instigate the next one. Nice. That's true. Maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll start sending surreptitious messages to people saying like, <laughs> "Hey, you know, Tori, did you hear what? Uh, did you hear what Grant Wilson was saying about you at the bar on Saturday night?" <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So. so the presentation that I went in and got to see was Aaron Ryder and Jael Depardo. From both of them were co-hosts on my favorite all-time ghost hunting show, which was Ghost Hunting and Cryptid Hunting. It was Destination Truth, mm-hmm. the show that launched Josh Gates' career, and of course he's still going on doing Expedition Unknown. Uh, and I continually flip flop those names around Destination Truth, Expedition Unknown, <laughs> and, and jumble them up every possible way. But it was just amazing to see them uh, talk about their experiences on the show. And, and they've both done shows since then as well. But, you know, we know that on that show, if you guys haven't seen it, it's on, they're rerunning it now on Travel Channel. But they would go to some of the most remote places in the world to go look into local folklore and legends. And Aaron talked about sailing out to Antarctica. And they knew it was going to be a four day boat ride. And they have to sleep in this boat strapped in because the waves are so intense that they'd be flung out of their bunks otherwise. And so you've got multiple straps going across yourself, and that's how you're sleeping. And waking up on the next day, uh, so just day two of the boat ride and seeing land, thinking, oh, no, something's wrong. And turns out the boat's engine died. And so they were able to get back to shore and... And they they were were able to find new agents when they came home. Yeah, exactly. Uh, They were shanghai I think it was in Argentina, as they were getting new parts for the boat. And then there was kind of a a, a bit of a, um, I don't know, a fight. Do we continue this or not? Because can we trust this boat? And they ended up taking a silent vote. And they, they passed to go and finish the episode by one vote. And But on the way out there, the entire crew wrote goodbye notes and placed them in bottles in case they were lost at sea it's morbid so yeah and and, you know they talk about also like being in guatemala and at the time they were down there looking for some cryptid local farmers were being beheaded by the militia groups in the area and and so that they had to lay on the ground of the bus so that nobody could see these people that don't belong here traveling through these jungles so it's just you know not even getting into the ghost story side of it it was amazing to see what they went through to make the show happen oh and my favorite fact i learned you know, we see them for an hour per week, 
And we always see at the end, it's a wrap up, like they fly back to LA and here's what we found. But they said they went out when the show was on the air for three or so months at a time. They had one bag to pack, 50 pounds, and they had to be ready to shoot in 14 different countries all back to back for the season. I cannot believe, like hats off to them even more. <laughs> that they It's called yeah, power that. packing. Wow. Yeah, like I don't know if my underwear would last that long. Like how many <laughs> pairs can you bring for three months in 14 different countries? Well, that's, that's when you that's realize how unnecessary underwear is when you know push comes to shove. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that's what they called commandos, right? Um, there we go. <laughs> that's cool. I got to see uh, Nick Redfern's presentation on cryptozoology and finally got learned the proper way to pronounce uh, the Boleskine House on Loch Ness. That oh. was owned, I know, I've said it in like six different episodes because we talked because Jimmy Page owned it, yeah. Alistair mm. Crowley owned it. And so I always say, like, I was always like, Boleskine, like it's one of those Moleskine notebooks or whatever. I don't even know if I sang that right. It's probably Moleskine too. I thought it was Moleskine. Oh, yeah. Or I Moleskine. don't know. <laughs> But either way, I've been saying it wrong for four years of the See You on the Other Side podcast and finally learned how to say Boleskine House. Well, you only had to drive a thousand miles to learn that. Well, and that place burned down in 2015. We've talked about it before, but it's such an interesting place because it was owned by Alistair Crowley. It was owned by Jimmy Page, and they both performed rituals there. And so were they performing rituals that brought something over that would make appearances of the monster happen? Oh, that's cool thought. Yeah, and, and so that's kind of the, the tack that Nick takes in his discussion about crypto uh, is very different than Lauren Coleman. Lauren Coleman's very much on the physical side. He's like, these things are lost animals that we just haven't discovered yet. And Nick's more like, well, I think they're things that we kind of maybe wheeled into existence, like Freddy Krueger in New Nightmare. Well, that's pretty cool. It sounds yeah. like it was a good presentation. I would have loved to have checked out some of those... Uh, talks that were happening, but I don't regret spending two days at the CU on the other side and uh, American Ghost Walks and What's Your Ghost Story booth because it was a blast. And well, why don't you tell everybody what we did? Oh, yeah. We had, okay, so we had a paranormal quest that we sent yeah. everyone on, which was a three part game of sorts, wouldn't you say? Something would, of a game? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was a game. We start with a question at the uh, American Ghost Walks part. And because you have the Minneapolis ghost tour, I'd start with a Minneapolis question. And I thought it'd be easy. Uh, so the first day I picked, what's your favorite Prince song? And then the people would say their favorite Prince song. And I'd tell them a story about how they see Prince's ghost at Paisley Park. And about the strange happenings and the, um, like the military ghost that they have at the First Avenue and, and stuff like that. And so I tell them that story. And it was funny because like some people, you know, some kids were kids. And I was like, well, Prince may be a little bit before your time or whatever. But the first day, the question was, what's your favorite Prince song? And by a country mile, a nor I mean, uh, by a northern western Minnesota mile, which is an extra like extra mile and a half. <laughs> and um, it's slippery too. Purple Rain was the most popular song. Yeah, that was a landslide. There was a couple 1999s, a couple When Doves Cry. And interestingly, the second day you made your question a sports question, asking everyone who their favorite Minnesota Viking is. Yeah. And I'd say that the paranormal crowd <laughs> is not a sports ball <laughs> yeah. liking crowd. I so. dropped a paranormal bomb. <laughs> but day. it was, and it wasn't by a small, I mean, it was like... I would say the vast minority even voted on that because people were like, I don't even know a single Viking player. Yeah. So I mean, I figured they just say the quarterbacks now because in Wisconsin, yeah. you'd be like, because I said, and the thing is, nobody like got the joke too. And I'm like, it's also <laughs> acceptable to say Green Bay Packers. Like when I said, yeah. who's your favorite Minnesota Viking? And they'd be like, I don't know. I'm like, well, it's also acceptable to say you like the Green Bay Packers. And then everybody looked at me like I was the biggest <laughs> jack off in the place. <laughs> So that was step one on the paranormal quest, and you get a little passport stamp for that. And then the second step was for the CU on the other side, country, if you will. <laughs> and that's where I was taking votes for on day one. We were voting for everybody's favorite paranormal topic. And between ghosts, cryptids, UFOs, and demons, ghosts won by a landslide. Not shocking. Yeah. A little shocking that demons was in second place, though, I think. Yeah, demons over UFOs. I was like, yeah. who are you, you people? And I think UFOs got last place. No, cryptids barely oh. registered at all. <laughs> so that was that was kind of interesting. And then the second day, we asked everybody for their favorite famous ghost. Uh, and the, the choices were Slimer, Beetlejuice, Casper, and the Ring Girl. <laughs> and who do you think won? Uh, I'm hoping it was Beetlejuice. 
I'm afraid it was the friendliest of ghosts. I couldn't believe Casper. that. I was so surprised. I thought Slimer was going to run away with it in yeah. this ghost hunting, ghost busting crowd. And then stop three on the paranormal quest. Yeah. Well, you know, since I run what's your ghost story dot com, I thought it was only natural to ask what's your ghost story. And uh, and, and I'd ask people if they would go on camera to tell their story. And a lot of a lot of people did. Yeah. Um, that was not a requirement. And I should have given like a little extra gold star. <laughs> but if yeah. they did. But a lot of people shared their stories. And I was expecting a lot of it to be I was on this ghost hunt at Eastern State Penitentiary or, or Velisca Axe House or something like that. But so often it was a very like emotional and personal story yes. about a, a relative coming back. And it was really sweet. Yeah, but it was a great way to connect. And that's I think what these events are all about, because a lot of times we're out there uh, being quiet in the dark, <laughs> trying to talk to dead people. But it was really great to connect with flesh and blood right across the table. Strangers connecting. It was. And I have to say thanks to everyone who stopped by, you know, not just for stopping by and for saying hello but for being so forthcoming with your personal stories because i'm still processing a lot of that i mean i heard almost all the stories that were told to scott and there were i mean there were tears shed at our booth Mm -hmm. it was really intense i had a couple people that didn't even make it to the whole you know like paranormal uh, quest and Mm. they come in they start kind of just making small talk because sometimes the booth was super busy and so yeah. they were kind of like Wendy was talking to somebody and Scott was talking to somebody and then once I asked him what their favorite Prince song was then I'd just be like hey what, what's up and <laughs> you know and they'd be like well what brings you here or and I had a couple people tell me that they had experiences when they were children and they come to this convention to try to talk to somebody to help them make sense of that experience Hmm. Like I, I one lady just start out and she's like, she 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 just goes into it and says, well, when I when I was a kid, and my mother would say like, I need you to go in the basement and next to the you know get something from the ice box. I'd go downstairs and there he was just standing next to the ice box, yeah. and I told my mother about him and she wouldn't you know, and and he was there in different rooms and she just had this, she was haunted by something when she was a child. And then she couldn't explain it, and uh, she just started, you know, like tearing up and everything. And I'm like, holy crap. Like, imagine yeah. living with that kind of thing your whole life. Exactly. And it's always fun at these conferences because it's kind of a safe place where you can share that stuff because, you know, generally the population at the conference is going to be accepting. We're ready to believe you. <laughs> at least willing to listen and hear it out. Well, I thought Bigfoot would be more popular, or cryptids would be more popular in the poll because, uh, number one, there was several Bigfoot research organizations there Mm -hmm. and female based too (laughs) yeah that's right and and number two i must have talked to like four or five different people who had bigfoot sightings yeah we had stories about sasquatch we had stories about goat man there we go goat man so cool (laughs) and that area up there has had a lot of sightings including the winner of our our drawing even shared some some unique stories with me so uh by the way, congratulations, Daniel. Yes. <laughs> we, we saw Daniel on the other side. So he won the gift pack, which was uh, tickets yes. to any of uh, the Haunted History Tours from American Ghost Walks, the Sunspot CD and T-shirt and stuff like that. And then uh, Scott's fine books on Chicago mm-hmm. Ghost Haunting. Yes. And, and a little Halloween basket and a haunted gingerbread house. And a haunted gingerbread house, which I'm sure he's making right now. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> but the, the, the fact that so many people had like Bigfoot sightings really kind of blew my mind. And yeah. So, and so I was expecting cryptids, uh, you know, to be a little more popular. But we, I mean, it's just a place where you can feel free to be like, yeah, I, I've talked to a dead person or, you know, I've seen this and I've seen, I, I, it's weird because in normal life, you know, when you hang around the squares or the straights or whatever, you don't get to it, that person just popping out and being like, yeah, like my father's still, like he still shows up in my room. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was really neat to learn some of the local traditions and, and the local cultural yes. things because there were a lot of Ojibwe indigenous people there that shared some of the spiritual beliefs and, and things that they had seen on the land there. Uh, so that was really, really cool because we don't get that many opportunities to learn that type of thing around here. No, it was, I believe we're in the White Earth Reservation. Mm -hmm. Um, is where we were. And so you got to learn a lot of Indian and Ojibwe stories and stuff that I'd never, you know, heard of before. So that was really uh, something nice to get to, you know, to get to know our fellow Americans a little better that way. Yes. Since ghosts were the most popular topic, 
we decided to talk to some of the people we'd meet at the convention and the people that would take a few minutes to share their stories with us. And we wanted to get a ghost experience with them. So let's go to the tape for a little bit of fun <laughs> live from the Shooting Star Paracon uh, at the casino in Monument, Minnesota. All right, so we're here right now with Aaron Ryder, who has been all over the world visiting all sorts of unusual places, uh, looking for the I don't know, most bizarre possible mythical creatures, uh, supernatural beings, and so on and so on and so on. When you think of your favorite personal experience, on one of your, whether it was on a TV show or even just at home unpacking one day and suddenly something bizarre happened, what jumps out to you? It's such a tough question. I think, you know, like you said, I've been on investigations all around the world and I've had so many incredible experiences that have reshape my perspective and I'm incredibly open-minded but at the same time it's hard not to be you know a believer uh, after some of the things that we've seen captured I uh, I've been recently talking about um, the suicide woods and our investigation to the Akigawara forest in Japan um, the that was one of those experiences where we not only captured something which was this incredible um, dark mist um, that uh, kind of took shape, came out of the ground, uh, kind of rised, r- rose up, and then went right back down. Um, but I also felt a presence. I also felt something really negative. It's very cold, very negative. I don't know if you know the, the story of the place, but this is a place where about 30 people go to commit suicide there a month. Mm-hmm. They actually have um, a crew of people that come in and take the bodies out, and it's just, you, you wonder what's drawing them there. Um, uh, it has to be something really, you know, negative that they're they're going there, they're being, you know, pulled there. Uh, so that's one of those places that really um, a very tactile experience. It was one of those places where I felt this is haunted. Sure, and, and there are those places around the world. Uh, that's uh, absolutely the most famous. But even Pasadena, California, has the Suicide Bridge, the Colorado Street Bridge, where it's over a hundred people died over the last less than hundred years, I believe. How can that place not be affected? by sure. so much darkness sure. going on there on a regular basis. Yeah, it becomes the chicken or the egg, you know, was yes. was there something there first or has it grown from what's happened there or both? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And so uh, where can people find you these days? I, I know I first discovered both of you uh, from Destination Truth, one of my favorite shows of all time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, but yeah, certainly want to keep up with your continued adventures yeah destination truth is incredible they're actually re-airing it now on the travel channel uh in front of expedition unknown which is josh's new show Mm -hmm. uh i've also done chasing ufos for national geographic uh currently you can find both jael and i on um the unexplained which is on the history channel it's a show about conspiracy theories and uh, i'm shooting a new show for the travel channel right now called monster mysteries which will come out in the new year but you can always check out um, my website, uh, AaronRider.com, or my uh, Twitter and Instagram, at AaronRider13, for more information. All right. And so the Illuminati is allowing you to put this show on the air. They haven't shut it down yet. Not yet. All right. Not yet. Not yet. We don't go into full disclosure, so maybe they've, they've, that's the reason. There's a line. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for taking course, a moment with us. Of course. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Okay. We're with Jal Depardo from Destination Truth, and we're just asking people what their personal uh, favorite ghost experience or, or ghost story is. My okay. Well, throughout the weekend, I've had a few people ask me what my most memorable investigation has been. Okay. And I'll I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again because it really it really does resonate. Um, it was when I traveled to Chernobyl with Destination Truth. Um, we were in the Ukraine, and a place like that will inherently have really intense energy because sure. it is a place that had such a, a, a crazy disaster and um, so much tragedy and fatalities. So walking around in the streets of Pripyat, which is basically an abandoned town um, that's been frozen in time. It's, it's like a skeleton of the past. Okay, so, you know, we've all seen, like, the YouTube video where, like, it's like people, like, breaking into that town and taking a look at that because, like, Soviet Union in the 1980s. So you guys actually got to go in there and, and check it all out. Did you have to wear a, a hazmat suit or anything like that? Okay. Yeah, so not only were we contending with 
these stories from the locals that were saying, you know, that there were ghost apparitions and sightings. Um, so that in and of itself is spooky. But then also, on top of that, we had the radiation to contend with. And so we're walking around. Are you like, you know what? I just wanted to be an actress. Like, what am I doing here? Um, well, I definitely have an adventurous spirit, and I, I'm, I'm a, kind of a, a big history fan. So okay. for me, it was it was really cool. Um, uh, but yes, we were walking around with an anti-radiation. I was walking around with an anti-radiation suit. We all were, and um, it was very cumbersome. And I had the, this mask on, and I mean, just walking around in the dark and, and fumbling around with um, a Geiger counter and trying to measure radiation and saying, okay, once it starts to beep, like step back, step back. This is dangerous. And did you guys have like any professionals with you at a point? It wasn't just like the regular crew or anything. You have some kind of handler to help you with that kind of thing? Like, was that in the budget? Well, we, in order to go into Pripyat, into Chernobyl, you have to have a government official escort you in. Okay. So we had that person, and he was trying to make sure that we stayed within the parameters of safety because there still is radiation there. Sure. Um, but it was very creepy, and there were, you know, all these abandoned buildings, apartment buildings, a school, a supermarket, an amusement park, and I remember one of the nights we were we were walking around in the school, and um, there was like a, a music classroom, okay, and we were in one of the corridors, and we actually heard like a note from the piano, like like someone struck the note of the. the, the one of the keys. Yeah. And we heard the music coming through the corridor. And it was like, it was just, but the whole thing energetically was just really intense and, and, and a profound experience for all of us. right there. And so when you were in it, though, um, was there ever a point, like, did it feel that, um, we talk about the, the fame of the disaster. And so I think about, that was one of the first natural disasters that everybody, you know, in the, in the world could hear about, like, right away and I mean even though this you know the certain was fairly close at the time. So when you felt the the stuff there, was it ghostly or was it spiritual or was it uh you know, what, what kind of paranormal thing do you think that felt weird there? Because um, I think the psychic energy of all these people hearing about the worst, you know, radiation and nuclear tragedy of all time um, versus, you know, what we think of as like a residual haunting where, you know, it's just a recording of a Roman soldier walking through a basement. Right. And so I just started, you know, I was just wondering if... If it, you know, some people say that um, when they feel something, they, something, some things feel sad, some things feel evil, some things feel like what emotionally was there any specific thing associated with it? Well, it, to me, it didn't feel evil. It was definitely tragic and sad. Um, but I think the reason it's one of the most memorable experiences I've had is because when we talk about the energies that you just mentioned, it's a place where they all converge. You know, because we're not just talking about a home and, then this year, and a, you know a show uh, someone who says that their home is haunted right. this is, this is a nuclear disaster of epic proportions with thousands of people who were displaced and people you know so many so many fatalities um, and that that echoed for years the effects of that echoed for years so there's like there's definitely the sadness of being you know torn away from your home uh, and the people that were lost instantly um, you know lost each other their families torn apart and all that stuff so I think it has all the energies converged so like a, a visceral feeling mm-hmm. absolutely in, in all right well that's pretty cool but maybe one day I'd lo- that's a place I'd love to explore because it seems like that just seems like a, an unbelievable opportunity it it was. I, it's interesting because it's scary because of the radiation, um, but I was just telling Ryder that I think I would actually want to go back. 
so much fun. All right, well, I hope you get the chance for the sequel. I know, me too. <laughs> so, so where's the next place people can find you uh, when they, when they want to see So uh, right now I have a show airing on History Channel. It's called The Unexplained, and that show is about conspiracy theories, uh, some government surveillance conspiracies, uh, and some history, which I'm excited about because I love history. Are there any conspiracy theories that you started out working on the show, you're like, this is obviously BS, and then after you did the episode, after you did the research, you're like, wait, this, there's something to this that I don't even, you know, that I didn't expect. Uh, well, I gotta say that, like, the show is based on a lot of historical things. Uh, so, you know, I, I kind of, I, can't, I was skeptical, but I, I didn't feel, no, I don't think I came away with anything, like, that I didn't feel could be possible. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. One, one of my favorites, uh, one of my favorite things that we, that I um, profiled was about whether or not a real life Jason Bourne is possible, if the CIA can actually program an assassin. Okay. Right. Like the Manchurian Kennedy kind of thing. Exactly. And so, um, we profiled the whole case of Sirhan Sirhan, who was, you know, um, in, he's been in prison for Bobby Kennedy's uh, assassination. assassination. At the hotel. And and he still, to this day, says he has no recollection of, of this murder. And he thinks that he was programmed by the CIA to, to do this. And, 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 you know, we talked to a lot of people about um, the tactics that they use for that kind of, that kind of work. Sure. It, was, it was really interesting. That's you didn't have to do anything yourself. Like, you didn't have to go through, pro, like, it didn't no. make you the guinea pig. Like, no, no, we're no. going to see. I don't know if I'd want to do that. I think I want to keep, uh, keep my memory. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. So make sure you guys check out The Unexplained on the History Channel. And thank you very much for your story. Thank you for your time. Awesome. Well, we're here with Aaron Marie Hogan, live from the Shooting Star Paracon in Manoma, Minnesota. Now, Aaron is an actress and a paranormal enthusiast. And Aaron, where are you originally from? I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri. So I'm in Los Angeles now. Okay. What have you in some of the movies or TV shows that people might have seen you? Um, probably the most likely place that paranormal enthusiasts have seen me is a paranormal entity or um, uh, there's also a paranormal thriller that's more recent called Dwelling. It's one of my my favorite things. Um, it's not so much into the paranormal. I was also on Ray Donovan in, in season okay. three for a short while. So there's quite a few places where you saw me and you'd be like, I wonder how much that girl got paid to do that. <laughs> but <laughs> All right. Now... I you speaking of roles, though, have you been drawn particularly towards any kind of like role that might you know? Since you were talking about the Mason Paranormal Entity, or the, were you drawn towards any kinds of paranormal roles because of an interest in that? Yes, um, I've definitely always been drawn a lot towards really horror, period, drama, period. Um, but the paranormal is probably the most interesting for me to play because I have such an interest in it, and. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely 100% a skeptic, but I want it to sure. be real so much. And there's so many, so many things that we just can't explain, and I don't know if we'll be, ever be able to. That I find making making movies about it really fun and interesting. And uh, you know, I think that's a great thing too because I find that the pop culture and stuff like this, the stuff we can all relate on, in a way that it can express the truth of what we're looking for when it comes to a, a, a paranormal discussion. Because we're all looking for answers to big questions. And sometimes when you're investigating, it's, it's hard to find answers to anything. So when you, when you express them through a film or a song or things like that, you can find a way to actually get at the emotional part of it, the emotional truth of it, um, even while you're telling a fictional story. So, Aaron, can you tell me about your first paranormal experience? Yeah, so um, the first paranormal experience I remember, uh, I was very young, maybe three or four years old, and I was outside my, my grandma's house, we were walking in, um, and my mom was talking about somebody who had recently passed away. And I said, well, Mom, what, what's, what's dead mean? What's that mean? And she said, well, that's when you, you know, you go to sleep and, um, you, you know, you don't wake up. You don't get up and walk around anymore. And sometimes people are sad. And, but, you know, maybe you go someplace after that and you're not around on right. Earth anymore. I said, oh, I know somebody who's dead. She was like, who? <laughs> I said, well, Grandpa. And she was like, well, you mean my grandpa, your great-grandpa, because he had recently passed away. So I, I had met him before. And I said, no, no, my 
my grandpa, your dad. And she was just really taken aback because I hadn't met my grandfather. He passed away a very long time ago. Um, so there, there was no way that I had a memory of him or right. uh, comprehended that he was really dead or anything like that. Sure. I definitely didn't know him. <laughs> right. Um, like you would say, like, oh, yeah, you're dead. I've been talking to your dad. Oh, right. Yeah. It, it was very strange. And... You know, she was really, and she's like, you know, what did, well, what do you and Grandpa talk about? And I said, oh, well, he just, you know, he comes sometimes when I'm playing in my room, and um, he, you know, tells me what a pretty girl I am, and um, that I'm really good at coloring, and he tells me how, how nice my coloring book looks, and, and things like that. It, like normal grandpa stuff. Sure. No, nothing miraculous and amazing. Right, I mean, but the only difference is that... He's see-through. I, I honestly, the thing is, I don't have those memories. Um, and I remember telling her about them. And I was 100% serious. I'm like, no, this this really happened. But I don't have any of those memories now. So it's a, it's a little, it's kind of disheartening. But, <laughs> but at the same time, it's comforting, though. But yeah. the fact that, yeah, you know, your mother's father still cared enough to come visit. Uh, yeah. You know, even though he couldn't do it in the flesh. Yes. And we actually, um, the first time my cousins had kids. Um, so that would be, I don't know about anything that happened, like, with my mom's sister, uh, with my aunt, um, or with her having kids. But when her kids had kids, uh, their little mobiles and things like that would start turning... And I never saw any of this, but they just kept, like, my family just kept talking about it. Oh, that, man. you know, the kid would cry or something, and then they'd be getting ready to go in there, and they'd hear the little mobile turning, and it would start going. And I'm like, you know, I, I betcha if this is a real thing, they're probably going in there to make the kids stop crying. Yeah. They don't want to hear them cry. Do the paranormal grandparents, yeah. you guys can save money, <laughs> save money on your child care with your paranormal grandparents. With your paranormal grandparents. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Erin. So where can people find you if they're uh, either in your, your latest uh, your latest role or if they want to find you on the web and learn more about you? Um, well, I'm a lot of places. Um, every Monday through Friday, I'm on twitch.com slash Erin okay. Marie OMG. So I'm, Are you a, uh, like a, a gamer? So I'm a gamer. I'm playing a okay. lot of competitive Overwatch most of the time. <laughs> All right. So if you're if you're if you're a Twitcher, make sure you check out Aaron Aaron Marie O M G. Yes. And then my um my Instagram and Twitter are the same handle Aaron Marie O M G, and my Facebook and YouTube are Aaron Marie Hogan. So you can find me at any of those places. Pretty easy to remember. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your story. With us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to throw a question. Oh yeah, Scott. So, Scott's going to come up and pinch hit. I, I'm making sure she can never leave the table and stretch her legs. Uh, you have your, your filmography is, ta- is full of so many supernatural tales, yeah. spooky stuff, including uh, Charles Manson, who yes. is pretty popular in paranormal. Um, uh, have you ever had any experiences on set? Yes. Because you are definitely brushing up against the occult over and over again. And plus, when you're talking about real life people, real life people that some of them have passed on, you wonder, like, yeah. hey, that's not how it happened. <laughs> Even going back yeah. to the yes. Inside. Yes. Um, yeah, actually, that was that was a big thing with House of Manson was um, the person I was portraying was is she is actually still alive, and I'm like, oh, geez, I need to do this right. I don't want this were you one off. of Were you one of the uh, Were you one of the Manson family, I or was, were you one I of the was, victims? I was Linda Kasabian. Oh, okay. So um, yeah, I wanted to make sure I got that right. <laughs> Did you were you able to meet her and talk to her at all? Um, I was able to get a hold of her um, her neighbor who found me on Twitter, um, but I wasn't really able to get too much information on her. She's more, um, I think, from from what I understand and the little bit of what ha- people I've been able to talk to who are close to her and things like that, um, she, she just kind of stays out Low of profile. the spotlight. She, she She's not feels, the pen pals type. No, no, no. She, she feels like she should have been punished and has felt that way for a long time. Sure. Um, so I think that took a very big toll on her wanting to be around society all that much. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, but actually when we were shooting um, we were shooting Hold Your Breath, we shot in the um, the Linda Vista Linda Hospital. Linda Vista Hospital. Alright, I've shot there yes. as well. Yep. Yes, and we definitely heard 
um, strangely enough, during the love scene, <laughs> um, the crew just kept hearing the weirdest things. Mm. And, and I, it wasn't the love scene. And it was, yeah, it wasn't the love scene. And Randy and I are like, what are you talking about? What? And they're like, this, this person talking over here. They won't shut up. And they're like, hey, shut up. There's no, don't be there. <laughs> um, so I never had that experience, but uh, almost the entire crew would swear that they, that they did during this particular scene. Um, you know, we heard during dwelling the house was very very old very creepy um, I think the producer actually lives there now but um, lots of footsteps someone apparently passed away there so there was just kind of an eerie feeling in certain parts of the house where we knew that had taken place um, so again I have you know eerie feelings I never had any personal experiences but other people on the crew will absolutely swear up and down that they did that's wild I, I, I worked on a movie that shot at Linda Vista Hospital Hospital and definitely had some minor paranormal experiences there then. And then was invited to bring a, a TV show in and lead a ghost investigation. And it was the most active night I've ever yeah. experienced. So what happened during your love scene? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was only conscious for part of it. Um, but I was working at a, on another movie, independent film, on Franklin in downtown uh, Hollywood. Well, near Hollywood, I should say. Uh, but it was right next door to the Soden House, which is one of the oh, places... Oh, I still live right there. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, one of the places... Uh, uh, it was, the house was designed by Lloyd Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright's son, and it's one of the places that maybe Elizabeth Short was killed. It's unlikely, but a lot of people believe it, and but one thing we do know is that the guy that did leave, that lived there at that time, there was a reason he was on the watch list of people that may have killed Elizabeth Short. He was a freaky dude. Um, but even in the house next door, the people that own it now, or at that time, use it mostly as a filming location. Uh, so most of the house was left as it was for the previous owner, the bedroom was floor to ceiling dead bolts. So whatever was going on in their house made them so frightened that they like barricaded themselves in their yeah. bedroom at night. Wow. That's, All right. It's, it's telling. I don't, I don't yeah, know if that's going to help with any no. kind of paranormal stuff, but uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure they can go through walls. Yeah. They're not fire. Awesome. There's no way. Awesome. Whatever makes you feel better. Community you know? reference. Right. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're here with Nick Redfern, a prolific paranormal author, uh, and he's been on Seeing the Side podcast a couple of times uh, talking about, well, one time we just talked about the cool stuff and the investigations he's done in his life, and then we also talked about The Slender Man, which uh, Allison and I were featured in his awesome book. Yes, you were. And Nick, I got to thank you uh, for putting us in the book because when... So my friends listened to our podcast, mm -hmm. and then they were listening to Mysterious Universe, and they're like, yeah, and Huberty, you're like, whole stories in that book, dude, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yes! Well, I wanted to, in I mean, I'm not just saying it because you're here, but <laughs> you both actually got really good, valuable input. You know, the, the fact that you'd seen something somewhat similar, but years earlier. Yeah. And Alison, you know, pointed out the whole thing with Coast to Coast. The, the night before the stabbing, you know, <laughs> right, and it was so just weird. bizarre. And those were sort of really seriously important parts of the story to demonstrate, you know, this isn't just, you know, people um, overdosing on reading too many stories on The Slender Man. You know, there's a genuine phenomenon here as well. So. Well, you know, and, and so at the Paracon today, Nick, something you talked about in your presentation that I thought was really interesting, and we also talked about in the Slender Man discussion, was the idea of so much energy, mm -hmm. mental energy that people yeah. have, hundreds of thousands of mm -hmm. people, then that having some kind of effect in the real world. Yeah. And so we talk about that, mm -hmm. like, particularly the Slender Man's on Coast to Coast. There's mm -hmm. a stabbing the next day that has yep. to do with this character yeah. that 90% of Americans haven't heard of, yep. but maybe the 10% mm -hmm. that have, 5% of those people all heard about it in one night. Yeah. <laughs> Now, of course, you know, as a result of the stabbings, I mean, just about everybody's heard of the Slender Man. You and know, even my dad <laughs> knows of the Slender Man. He's 86, you know. <laughs> right. He knows of the Slender Man. So, but, um, <laughs> the most popular topic uh, that we did our poll yesterday, Nick, uh, we asked people what they liked. UFOs, mm -hmm. cryptids, uh -huh. um, ghosts, or then we snuck in demons. It's like a joke. Yeah. Dude, demons came, <laughs> demons came in second. <laughs> so you never know if people are going to pick. Right. So the theme of this episode is we're talking to different people about ghost stories. Okay. And uh, Nick, has anything ever happened to you? 
Yeah, um, I'm not really got involved as such for the most part with with ghost hunting or ghost research. Uh, I tend to focus mainly on um, cryptozoology, the study of unknown animals, UFOs and related sub phenomena, and to a degree on conspiracy theories. But I'm not overly into like political yeah. conspiracies, really. Um, but I did have one really weird um, experience in the early 2000s, a ghostly experience, not one that I investigated, but which involved me. Okay. And um, we also involved uh, my ex-wife. And we, um, at the time, we were living just outside the Texas city of Beaumont, which is down by Galveston. Okay, if people so want to look it on, on a map. So all the way down. All the way down. And we liked that because that sort of... Um, Beach bum environment, you know, sure. living by living by the beach, you know, <laughs> hot um, weather, sun, it, sea. It's beautiful. Cold and, beer, you know, the right, whole thing. And, <laughs> right, and, and Galveston, yeah. like we've gone down there and played and told some ghost stories and stuff. Uh -huh. like, Galveston's got an amazing amount mm -hmm. of ghost stories too, like yeah. Jean Lafitte and everything down uh -huh. there used to run the island. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, yeah. so you guys are down by Beaumont. Yeah, down by Beaumont, and. We had a, a pet Sharpe dog named Charity. The Sharpe's are the, the wrinkly dogs, you know. Okay, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, she was eight years old when she died. Now, unfortunately, Sharpe's have this inherited condition. And it's called um, familial Sharpe fever. And uh, unfortunately, it's caused by people who interbreed them too much to provoke more and more wrinkles. Oh, uh, so yeah. they're like trying to get them for show dogs yes, or whatever? yeah. And the problem is that they become more and more, not so much inbred, but the, the DNA becomes sort of too close. And, Mutated. And, and, yeah, and it causes problems, one of them being familial Sharpe fever. And it's like, very much like um, a severe bout of flu uh, mixed in with a fever. And then before you know it, it's pneumonia and death. You know, it's kind of, the, in, in animals, it's that kind of equivalent. Okay, so that, and, that's horrible. <laughs> yeah, and she fell sick on a Sunday morning, took her to the vet's Monday, and she was a little bit um, more re um, responding. And um, back in England, I used to have a dog, um, uh, excuse, let me start that again. It's all can, right. Can you edit it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. no worries. All right. Um, Back in England in the 1980s and 1990s, I had a little Cairn Terrier dog named Susie. And as she got old, she actually was like 18 or 19 when she died. And in her later years, she got diabetes. So I had to learn how to give her the um, insulin injections. And so with Charity, when she fell sick, the doctor said, have you ever uh, given an animal uh, a shot? And I said, I actually have. I used to have a diabetic dog in England. Okay. So he said, so he gave me the treatment and she recovered for a day or so and then we went to pick her up at the um, and all the lights just went out in the room yeah. so. <laughs> well that's a bit spooky yeah anyway <laughs> um we went to pick her up and before we could get out the apartments the the veterinarian doctor phoned up and said i'm sorry to say charity just passed away suddenly yeah oh. uh, and um so we buried her that night on my um, ex-wife's dad's um, property, he had this huge property um, not tar far from the beach. And um, you know, said our goodbyes and put a little toy, one of her toys in there and everything. And you know, it was just a very sad period, is when any pet dies, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, everybody loves their pets, you know of what course. I mean? And, um, well, when we got back home, oh, well, on the way back home, Dana, that's that my ex-wife, she basically called out, said, come with us. And we got back to our apartment where we were living at the time and um, got into the house, sort of unloaded everything. Yeah, we were both sort of frazzled and fried, you know. And um, for some reason, I forget now, but I had to go into the garage to find something afterwards. And I went in there and I told... Dana to come here now and no word of a lie when we went in there it was just like walking into a wall of wet dog you know what a wet you know that oh yeah I know everybody the smell. knows what a wet dog smells right. like horrible smell but it's everybody knows what it is and it was just like we'd walked into it and with Dana saying you know come with us now over the course of the next few days um, a couple of other weird things happened um, the, our apartment was like a duplex, so all the rooms were on one side, okay. and there's one long um, 
corridor going down the middle, you know. And um, and Dana woke up to the, uh, and she wasn't like semi asleep or anything like that. Uh, she may actually not have been asleep. She may have just not been able to sleep. Sure. And heard like the what was clearly the sound of um, Charity's claws on the tiled floor. You know, pitter patter, pitter patter. Right. And um, she got that. And we also had a weird experience where she had like this favorite um, cushion she would sleep on. And like three days later, there was like an impression on it as if, you know, she'd the been dog was there. lying there. Yeah. And then the weirdest thing of all was that the end of that following, the following week after she died, we were due to move to Dallas to live. And so we got um, like a big... Penske truck, which sure. I drove all the way to Dallas, which was a nightmare. <laughs> I just, like 30 I, feet long with a trailer and a car on the back. I'm with you. We had, a, we had our van break down one time uh, in Dallas, and then we just had to sell it. Like uh, it, it, it oh got wow. to the point where we had to sell it. So mm. we had to take a Penske truck back to uh, yeah. the 1,200 miles back up to Wisconsin. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's a so nightmare. So I, I feel you. Yeah. So we were due to, um, to drive up to Dallas the following Friday, the, the week after. And... Um, what I said to Dana, I said, I'm going to go back in, inside and just make sure we haven't left anything behind. Mm -hmm. And because we'd had these weird experiences in the apartment, Dana was kind of like worried that like her essence, her life force, soul, whatever you want to call it, would be left behind. And that was sort of an important, important part of the story and I explained why. So I went back inside and looked in all the cupboards and drawers, you know, like a little bit of... Like a small amount of like um, kind of uh, OCD, you know, making sure. sure nothing left behind. Of course. And um, so I looked through the drawers, cupboards, <laughs> under the bed, um, but because um, we left one of the beds there, we didn't need it. And um, and I went into the back room, which I used to use as my office. And behind there, there was um, like a little walk-in closet, and nothing there. And I sort of just jumped up to make sure there's nothing on the top shelf, which was like about seven feet high. And I saw something on the corner of the shelf. I couldn't see what it was, so I jumped up again, just rushed my hand across, and I knocked it off. What actually was, was a strip of negative of a photograph of charity in, a, a, in Dana's grandmother's yard, standing by a tree. And it was almost like a metaphor that by finding the negative was charity's way of saying, saying to Dana, I'm not going to be left behind, because I right. took the negative in my park it and we took it with us now when we left nothing else ever happened again and although I'm not by any means an expert in ghost hunting or anything like that but I do know a lot of people have said that they've had experiences where a family member whether animal or human mm -hmm. has died and it's almost like they stay around for a little bit and then it's gone you know and no like matter how much you want it to come back, the thing, whatever it is, doesn't. It's like it was there and then it's gone. And it's um, like a hangover. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, and that really, you know, uh, as I said, I haven't really been into big into ghost hunting right. or, or you know, really digging into the idea of life after death. But that really, kind of, was like a defining moment, you know, in terms of. Um, the whole encounter going from when she died and the, the wet dog smell, the impression on the cushion, the toenails or claw right, the, nails, right, whatever right you call Right, the, yeah. the claws on the floor. Um, and then Dana saying, you know, let's, I don't want it to be left behind. And within seconds, I found the negative on the shelf. I mean, it could have been a negative of anything. Right. And, and why should picture? it have been left up there anyway, you know? And it was just the timing was like a, a really weird synchronicity. And that did make me, th well, not just think, I mean... Did it provide you guys with some kind of... Yes, it did. Yeah, like comfort and a sense that, yes, yeah, she was gone now, but something survived. And I've since then, I've spoken to other people who've had pets and who said they kind of experienced that similar situation of feeling the presence still there. And then three, four, five days, it's, it's gone. gone. Yeah. And um, that really made me open my eyes more to Something life after else. death. I do believe there's a life after death, but I, I don't, I find it difficult to believe the literal 
black and white image of like pearly gates and oh, right. harps and all that kind of thing. Because it seems ridiculous. Yeah, you know, any more than I don't really believe in some guy with horns and a forked tail <laughs> prodding you into a <laughs> right. pit Punishing because you. you stole a packet of cigarettes 40 years ago or something, <laughs> you know. But I do think... I think like the ancients in the past knew something about like multi dimensions where perhaps a, a spirit goes and but they could only kind of reconcile it in in terms of simplistic terms of like heaven and hell. Sure. But I sometimes wonder if we could be looking at you know, like quantum physics allow is allowing now for like multiple dimensions. Right. And I sometimes wonder if the soul, whether it's an animal or a human is transferred, if you like, to some of these multiple dimensions that, as I said, the ancients might have considered heaven and hell. We could consider them a different um, layer of reality or something like that. No, I'm with so, you. I'm with yeah. you on that. So I think I think something survives death. I don't know what it is. Whether it's what you call the soul, life force, essence. Maybe we recycle. <laughs> right. Who knows? I don't know. But but all I know for sure from my own perspective and experience i do think something survives death and you saw that happen with uh, yeah. something giving you a little bit of comfort after you had the yes. hard loss of your pet yes yeah and i wouldn't want people to think that it was it wasn't like a subconscious thing just trying to cushion everything it was they, those things really happened you know and um and it was it was a sad experience what what happened but you know it was also like an inspiring thing as well to the idea that um you know it's not the end even if we don't know ourselves until we get there right you know and i, and I think from my perspective i understand why people want answers in this life but it's almost as if we're not allowed to sort of see yeah, the real picture in this life you know you just have to wait you know i'll stand by that story for as long as I'm around, you know, and um, I've never really had any other ghostly experiences that I can think of, but that one, that one was enough for me to... Make you think that there's something to it. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, and so, where can people find you, Nick, and what's the next book you're working on? Okay, well, I have a new book out in January, um, it's called Area 51, and Sweet. unsurprisingly, it's about Area 51. <laughs> And it's actually a big book. It's like 400 pages on the whole history of Area 51. And looking at the theories, you know, are there really crashed UFOs and dead aliens there? Or is it just classified super secret aircraft that, you know, the government doesn't want sure. us to know about? Or is it a bit of both? Um, so that'll be out in January. Um, I have a blog, which um, I update most days, called World of Whatever. And if you type in Nick Redfern into a search engine, the blog is the first one you'll find. And there's um, a contact section there, which will take you direct to Facebook. So people can reach me on Facebook message. And, um, and then, um, you know, people want to ask questions or they want to share a story. You know, I'm always happy, you know, because sometimes I get people who I'm, you know, really worried about something that's happened to them a bad experience say with like the shadow people or oh, the sure. black eyed children things like that so I'm always happy to chat with people and if I can give some advice or help them or refer them to you know someone who's an expert in another area um, you know I'm always happy to do that and people can also reach me at uh, Amazon I've got a Amazon Author dedicated page. page and whatever awesome so, so yeah. make sure you read all of Nick's books I can vouch for that they're great yep thanks <laughs> <laughs> so we want to thank our new paranormal friends for sharing their ghost experiences with us a lot of times it's not easy to share something where a lot of people might think that you're a little uh, crazy <laughs> and so for being able to share that I think that's really nice and we appreciate their trust that we weren't just gonna like edit it together <laughs> yeah so thanks so much to everyone who stopped by everyone we met if you'd like to see any of the uh, links of things that we've talked about here they will be in our show notes at othersidepodcast.com slash 218 and that will include if you told us a ghost story on camera uh, we will have a video on there of all of the stories that were shared with us uh, so yeah, definitely check that out and see what everybody else had to say. Fantastic. So hopefully we'll see you next time at the Shooting Star Paracon or maybe even earlier at a different convention or a Yay. Sunspot show when we get around and maybe play in your area. Speaking of Sunspot and the band, uh, the song this week, 
Now, we started working on the song uh, last week before we went to the Paracon because we knew we didn't only had so much time. So the idea was maybe using the shooting star uh, as the influence and the uh, inspiration behind this particular song. So the idea of this song is just about how fleeting some things are. And when you think about your youth and, and certain nights and everything that you thought you had the entire world in front of you, uh, but sometimes it burns up a little too fast, uh, just like a shooting star. And so this Sunspot track is called Best Laid Plans. For listening to today's episode, you can find us online at othersidepodcast.com. Until next time, see you on the other side. You know what? You can wish on a shooting star, Mike. We could wish for more Patreon. <laughs> we can, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like to join our Patreon community, which are, I mean, I, we think the Patreons are stars. They are absolutely stars. And uh, we try to do special shout outs, a special like ha- Facebook lives from events and things like that with our Patreons. Also cool articles. And don't forget, we did some live casts mm-hmm. right from the Paracon this week. Yeah. And uh, we would like to provide more of that for you. So if you're enjoying the kind of stuff that you hear on See on the Other Side every week, if you enjoy the Sunspot songs, or if you just enjoy hearing uh, Wendy and my uh, mellifluous voices, uh, then you can find out more about that at patreon.com slash sunspot music or othersidepodcast.com slash donate. And a big extra special thanks to our Patreon supporter, Ned. Dr. Ned is pledging us at a level that earns him a special, unique Shout out every single week. So, Ned, thank you so much. He gets the executive producer credit (laughs) every week. Thank you, Dr. Ned. Hey, and thank you guys, every part of our Patreon community, for the support you give. Um, It really means a lot to us. And anybody that we just met for the first time this last weekend, um, your your stories and your time and your attention uh, was really a a special thing. And so make sure uh, you subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher or Google or wherever you find your podcast so we can keep in touch can tweet us at other side podcast or uh, I'm sorry at other side talk um, and go to othersidepodcast.com um, and maybe we can hang out some more and don't forget that uh, what's your ghost story.com is also where you're going to find the very cool ghost stories that you told Scott and so make sure you check out what's your ghost story.com as well uh, where you can find a great community just like the community that we had at the shooting star Paracon thanks for listening coming from inside the house (laughs) sorry the things the neighbors are wrestling (laughs) 
All right. Da 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 da. <laughs> All right. That's nice. I really tried to ring one out there. <laughs>